Quick thing before we dive into uh, chapter two today. I don't want to do that yet. Let's back it up. Um, chapter two, just to let you know, as far as the reading goes, can be very thick. It can be very hefty. Um, it's a big switch from our first chapter where we kind of got our feet wet. We talked a little bit about what interpersonal communication is. We defined what communication was. We looked at a model of communication. And then we also looked at varying skill sets that you need to be a competent communicator. But if we remember anything from chapter one, it's that we, you need to be two things in order to be a competent communicator. It's being effective and being appropriate. And chapter two really takes that concept of being effective and appropriate and dives deeper into it by applying the varying factors that come along with culture. All of us have grown up in a culture. Um, we all come from different cultures, but if you are a human being on this earth, you are part of a culture, you grew up in a culture, whether or not you, you wanted to or chose to. And so because of that, this chapter is so important for us to get a good grasp on so that we can become truly effective and appropriate communicators. For all of you who cited adaptability as your number one skill set in your journals, you'll find that in chapter two, um, that'll be challenged a lot because in chapter two, we're going to visit a lot of varying situations where culture makes interactions a little messy and makes them a little bit harder to work through. And so because of that, let's dive right in to our chapter two lecture. And so the first thing I wanna do is define what culture is. And that can be a little tricky um, because I think it's a word that we use on such a regular normal basis that we need to situate it first in a social scientific perspective, in a communication studies perspective, before we actually dive deeper in with it and begin to play around with this notion of culture, why we care about it, and how it ultimately affects our communication and our relationships, which is the focal point of our class. So we're gonna go ahead and dive in here. Um, I'm looking, if you can see where my cursor is, I'm looking at these um, top three statements that I have right here. I'm going to dissect those first and then we'll dive in deeper to these three slides at the bottom where I break them down further. So culture, according to Samovar, is the languages, values, beliefs, traditions, and customs people share and learn. And so the key word I want you to get out of that is that it's shared. So no one person, is born and then just creates their own culture by themselves. The culture is just that. It's a culture because it is shared by other human beings, groups of human beings who have come together and learned to live together with shared knowledge, shared customs, beliefs, perspectives, and traditions. And so that's what a culture is. And so that share word is very, very key because when you're speaking to someone who comes from a different culture, you also have to take into to consideration all that you know about that culture and all you may not know about that culture. Which leads me into my second point, culture therefore, because it is a human constructed idea. So culture does not exist in the natural biological world, right? So the culture of being an American um, was created and constructed by human beings um, who, create, who share and co-create what we know as the American culture. And even American culture, because we have 50 states that are all very large, um, American culture varies quite greatly across those 50 states as well. And so it's very important to re remember that culture therefore is bound by perception and definition. Culture, because it is created by human beings, exists solely within the minds of human beings. And the only way we can see culture, right, um, as the same way we would see a physical object, is by seeing the traditions that people practice in said culture. So it is bound by our perception of that culture and our definition of that culture. And lastly, as I touched upon, culture is a social construct, meaning that socially as human beings, because it is shared, we constructed it. It's a construct, meaning we made it up. And I know that that sounds very frivolous. I'm, this definition makes culture sound very not as vibrant as we uh, as you may think, but um, try to take the word construct out of our normal everyday use and look at it from a theoretical perspective. It is a construct in that it's an ideology that human beings created, right? And we co-create, we recreate culture all the time and it is super fantastic. 
So let us move on to uh, culture and co-culture and let's dive a little bit deeper into what culture is and why it is important. And so here's a picture of the US-Mexico border. And I always have this on my slide for this chapter before we move into deeper conversations about culture. Because as I said earlier, culture is bound by perception and definition. And perception, the best metaphor I can give for you, to you of perception, because just like culture, you can't quite see someone's perception, right? It's in their head. Um, and so the best metaphor I can give you um, to be self-aware of your own perception and to learn how to be in check with other people's perception is by thinking of perception as a set of sunglasses. So when you wear sunglasses, they have a tint to them. So they have a black tint or a yellow tint or a blue tint or whatever the color of your sunglasses are. And when you put on your sunglasses, it obviously changes the colors around you, right? Things may look darker or more yellow or more blue depending on the tint of your sunglasses. And sometimes you might wear those sunglasses for the whole day and not recognize that the world or the colors that you're looking at aren't truly the colors that they are. They're tinted or they're altered by the lens that you are wearing. So if you're having a hard time understanding the way the book and I both use the word perception, think of it as sunglasses, as lenses that we're looking into the world. And we forget that we're wearing those lenses all the time. Each and every single one of us does. And so back to this picture, I show this picture quite often um, because I do have students uh, who are in my class and they have never been to the US Mexico border. For those of you who have been, I, you know, yay, you'll know exactly, you've seen this picture before, you know. Um, but for those of you who haven't, I love this picture because whenever I show it to someone who has not been to the US Mexico border, um, they naturally assume that this left side right here is Mexico and that this right side right here is the US. And that's actually flipped. So this right side right here is actually Mexico, Mexico. Uh, Mexico and this left side right here is actually the territory of the United States and I show this picture to try to help us become more self-aware and awaken ourselves to the perceptions that we have for someone who has not been to the US Mexico border a major way that they might actually have information about the Mexico border is through media or through other secondhand accounts of other people um, and not necessarily through firsthand experience and because of that that's going to build their perception when you see um, how media or other people frame um, the Mexi US Mexico border, you end up with a certain set of perceptions that you think you know about the US Mexico border. And so this picture is a really good challenge to the prevailing ideas of what we think the US Mexico border looks like. And this is, of course, just one snapshot and a very, very long border. And in a lot of ways, the way that we learn other people's cultures, the way we interact with other people, very much is a snapshot of their culture as a whole, right? So for example, I'm a Vietnamese woman. When you speak to me or meet me, you may know a little bit about Vietnamese culture, but again, I'm just a snapshot of my whole Vietnamese culture. And so as we move through this lecture, I'm going to try to make sure that that nuance is still there, that we understand the complexities that come along with culture and identity and communication. But I love this picture because I think it's such a great kind of awakening for those who may or may not have realized that Mexico's on this side, US is on this side. It's a beautiful place to be if you have not been. Uh, culture and co-culture. So we just define culture, we define perception, we talked about how culture is a social construct, and now let's move into how culture plays out in our everyday lives. So we all belong to in-groups and we all belong to out-groups. And I love the way they term these words because I feel like they're so self-explanatory. So in-groups are groups that we identify with and out-groups are groups that we view as different. So for example, if uh, because I am Vietnamese, the Vietnamese culture is an in-group that I identify with because I am ethnically Vietnamese. I also uh, identify with the in-group of being an American. Um, I identify with the in-group of being a Chafee faculty member. I identify with the in-group of being a professor. All of these different groups that I am a part of are my in-groups. and. As you read through this chapter, I really encourage you to take some time and self-reflect about all the different groups that you belong to. At times, we don't realize that over the course of our lives, 
we have developed a large amount of in-groups that we are a part of, either by choice or not. So I didn't choose to be born Vietnamese, right? This is just how I'm packaged. I didn't choose to be born um, female either, but I'm also part of the in-group of female human beings. And so those are things that maybe we didn't choose to be part of, but we are part of those in-groups. But I did choose to become a TV faculty member and I did choose to become a professor. And those are in-groups that I did choose to be part of. And so it's always interesting to look at the varying groups that you've built up in your life. Out groups are the exact opposite. So there are groups that we don't identify with. So an easy out group for me would be uh, being a male. I'm not a male uh, and I, therefore it is an out group for me. Um, out groups can, uh, and in groups are, are multitudinous, meaning that they can have very, very different cross sections in our lives. So I am a female professor who is Vietnamese living in California, right? So I have all these very crossing amounts of in-groups. Uh, I am a Warriors fan. I am a 49ers fan. Sorry to anyone who dislikes those, but we just want a championship, so I feel good about that. Um, so uh, when you look at your in-groups and out-groups, you'll see how much they kind of feed into your identity. And also, I want you to put a bookmark on this for in-groups and out-groups because when we talk about the sense of self and identity in chapter three, our next chapter, this is an idea that we're gonna constantly revisit. So in the same way that in chapter one, I told you uh, that whatever we learn in chapter one, we're gonna bring into chapter two. Same thing here, whatever we're learning in chapter two, we're gonna bring into three, all right? Lastly, social identity is that part of that self-concept, ding, 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 as I talked about, we'll develop the self-concept a little bit more in chapter three. I'm not gonna dive deep into it right now because that's not the focal point of our lecture, but social identity is that part of our sense of self that we get from our group membership. So the fact that I am a teacher, for example, is a big part of my social identity because I see myself as belonging to a particular group of, of workers, of employees, of a, a certain type of discipline and field. And so culture, therefore, plays a, a huge amount of roles in our lives. But as I said, there's a lot of nuance. So right here, I have just replicated the definition of culture. So the same definition that we saw on our first slide. And I will put it here so that you could compare, contrast it easily to the definition of co-culture. Co-culture is the perception of membership in a group that is part of an encompassing culture. Again, perception. So one easy example of that is we are all, as we live in America, part of the overall umbrella culture of being American. However, we belong to the coal culture of being Californians. I myself, uh, I was born in Vietnam, but I immigrated here and I've lived in Southern California all my life. So being a Southern Californian is all I know. And for any of you who have traveled outside of state or even up north to Northern California, you'll see. I'm sure you have noticed even a little bit that your Californianness kind of shines through, right? So when I go lecture in, I've lectured in Texas and New York and Florida, I can definitely feel like I'm part of the out group there because I'm not part of the coal culture of being a, from Florida or from New York or from Texas. My coal culture is I'm Californian, specifically Southern Californian, right? So a coal culture is whenever we have an overall over encompassing culture, but we break it up into smaller pieces. One example I can give you as it relates to ethnicity is that um, I see myself as both an American and Vietnamese, and that those two pieces are part of my coal cultures, right? So you can't, I, I don't want to call myself fully Vietnamese because I didn't grow up there. Um, I'm a Vietnamese-American because I am of Vietnamese descent, but I grew up in America, so I see myself as an American. So going back to my idea of social identity, that's where I get my sense of self-concept of being a Vietnamese dash American because those two pieces of me are part of my sense of self. Those two groups of being Vietnamese and American build, um, help build a, a part of my sense of self, my identity, who I think I am. Is that clear? So um, as you go through this uh, part of the lecture and the readings, one of the cool things that you might find is that you are part of lots of different cold cultures in the same way that you're parts of lots of in-groups and out-groups. And because of that, you'll find that your identity is a lot more complex than maybe initially you thought you did, which is why I love this chapter. So moving on, um, why do we care about this? So 
Y'all know me, I really like to give you a lot of the theory, a lot of the ideas, explain them, but why do we care? Why is this worth knowing in the realm of communication? And this is important because in order to be a strong interpersonal communicator, you also, to a certain length, have to be a strong intercultural communicator. And intercultural communication, in the same way that we define interpersonal in chapter one, now we're going to define what is intercultural communication. And I put the, the definition right here. This is the definition as it is presented to you in your textbook, um, word for word. And I'm going to kind of distill this, this very hefty looking definition right now. But intercultural communication describes the process that it occurs when members of two or more cultures or co-cultures exchange messages in a manner that is influenced by both their cultural perceptions, symbol systems, both verbal and nonverbal. Oh, that is a lot to take in. So let us break that down. So. As I talked about cultures and cult cultures, you can be part of a, of a culture, but also share different co-cultures. So, for example, as someone who is an American, I share the culture of being an American with someone who lives in New York. But if I meet someone from New York, they and I have different co-cultures. So I never grew up in New York. I visited once, but I'm definitely not a New Yorkian by any means. And so we may or may not experience some difficulty in our communication, even though we're communicating in English, because of our different cultures. We might use different slang words, different terms. We might speak at different speeds and rates. We might pronounce things a little bit differently. We might have different nonverbal communication. Definitely when I was in New York, I found that people had, at least in my experience, a much smaller personal bubble than we do here in Southern California. And so even nonverbal communication can differ as well between co-cultures. So so always keep that in mind. It doesn't always have to be the difference between someone living in America and China. It could literally be the difference between the Inland Empire and Orange County, for example, or Northern California, or Southern California. Cold cultures also make a big difference in how we communicate with one another. The second part of this definition, you can see here that we exchange messages in a manner that is influenced by our different cultural perceptions. That is key. Intercultural communication basically refers to this idea that anytime I'm communicating with someone from a different culture or co-culture, we're going to use different what we call symbol systems. That could be languages, that could be slang both verbal and nonverbal, as I just said. And the key thing there is that it's influencing our communication. It's either influencing it a lot or little, it doesn't matter. It's still considered intercultural communication if it influences it. Um, so that is why I have this little definition right here of the word salience. You're going to see this word occasionally in our textbook, so I think it's important that I explain it for you here. But salience just means the weight or the importance of something um, to a particular person or phenomena. And I know that that doesn't really help clarify it, so let me give you an example. If I meet with one of you um, in my office or over the phone, I'm sure that even if we are of different ethnicities or come from different cold cultures, that those differences will not have a lot of salience in our interaction because we both live in Southern California, we're, we both speak English, we both are part of Chafee Fontana, and so we're gonna have a lot of commonality that even though we might be from different cultures, we might be a different age, we might come from different backgrounds, you and I, as student and professor, will have a decently easy time communicating, I'm pretty sure. However, when I traveled to Japan and tried to teach in Japan, I experienced a high level of cultural salience in that situation because even though I was still trying to communicate with students, it was much harder to communicate with those students because we had vastly different cultural backgrounds and upbringings and different styles of speaking English. So even though these Japanese students did learn English, they learned ESL in Japan, their style of speaking English is not the style that we grew up with here in America as Americans. So you can see that with you and me as Chafee Fontana campus students and, and professors speaking one-on-one, -on -one, there will probably be a low intercultural salience, whereas when I travel abroad and teach abroad, there's a higher cultural salience. So in one situation, cultural differences way more or mean more than the other. So between us, I'm pretty sure we won't have super big cultural differences, and if we do, 
um, I'm sure we can communicate still very effectively, whereas in other countries I might have a harder time. One cool thing, though, that I want to throw out here is that two um, prominent researchers in our field, Goody Kunst and Kim, um, both found over time that interpersonal factors soon outweigh intercultural factors. What that means in a nutshell is that let's say you meet someone and they are from a completely different background from you. Um, they're a different ethnicity, they might speak a different language, they might practice a different religion, they might be a different age. And you at first might have a high intercultural um, uh, salient factors in your interactions. You might have a really hard time communicating because there's just too many factors interrupting your communication process. Again, referencing back to our communication model in chapter one, you might have a lot of noise, both psychological and external, and your environments just might not cross over very much. And so when you exchange messages, you don't know how to decode them. For more, check out that model in chapter one. Um, and so you might struggle at first with someone who's incredibly different from you, but Goody Kunz and Kim have found that the longer you try to develop a relationship with that person, no matter how big your intercultural differences are, once you develop an interpersonal, a one-on-one -on -one personal relationship with that person, intercultural factors just fade out, meaning that they don't, they don't have a big salient fact. They're not salient anymore. They don't matter as much anymore. And that is absolutely awesome. What that tells me is that no matter what cultural differences we may have on this earth, we can all get to know each other a little bit better and overcome those differences by developing strong interpersonal one-on-one -on -one relationships with one another. This is also um, akin to the idea that um, researchers have found that uh, people have less in uh, uh, less internal biases so or are less likely to exhibit sexism racism or any other discriminatory behavior if they know someone from that particular culture so for example statistically 60 percent of americans um, do not know on a personal level someone who is muslim and so they have found that those Americans who did not know a Muslim person as a friend, as a one-on-one -on -one relationship, were more likely to exhibit biases or discriminatory behaviors towards Muslim people. And this goes for all different types of ethnicities, religions, cultures, you have it. Um, studies have found that as long as people are sheltered and not experiencing other ethnicities and cultures, they're more likely to exhibit discriminatory, racist, or sexist um, behaviors. But if they know at least one person on a personal level from that culture, they are more likely to be welcoming and trying to be empathetic of other people's cultural practices. Very, very awesome. And so moving on, um, cultures, values, and norms are captured by five values. And so you may note that um, in uh, your calendar, I asked you to please focus on the different cultural values that are listed in the chapter. And these are the values that we are going to talk about right now. And so what these values are, are they, they are ways that we look at and measure cultural differences across all the different spectrums. So I want to preface this discussion by saying that not all cultures are one or the other. I want you to think of these different values as on a spectrum, on a continuum, where a culture can lay anywhere in this spectrum, okay? I'm going to touch on that one more time when I finish this discussion, so but just keep that in the back of your head. So the first value we're going to talk about is high versus low context cultures. What is a low context culture? A low context culture uses language, verbal language, primarily to express their thoughts and their feelings. Whereas a high context culture does not use verbal and they rely more so on nonverbal cues. I have found that this is probably one of the most difficult cultural values for my students to understand. And I get it because it's very hard to envision like what is a low context culture? What's a high context culture? What does that even mean? What does that look like? So first off, the United States um, is a low context culture. We definitely like to be very vocal. We like to use our words, our verbal language a lot. 
you even see that built into our education system and what we value. So for example, some of you may have been required to take public speaking as part of your GE requirement. And I'm sure a majority of you, if not all of you, were required at least once in your life in your K through 12 education, all the way up to high school. Some of you were required at least once to present something in class. Um, I know, for example, my younger cousins who are only eight had to give a public speech um, in their class, in their English class the other day. And so as Americans, we highly value the force and power of verbal language. However, other cultures are more high context where they don't see speaking as a source of power, but they see silence as a source of power and they communicate primarily using nonverbal body signals. A great example of this is primarily um, major Asian cultures such as um, Japanese cultures or Chinese cultures tend to be high context, meaning that they do not speak as much as they rely on their nonverbal communication. One great example of this is this video right here that I put on my slide. I will not play it right now because I want to get through this uh, lecture with you all, but I really encourage if you are struggling understanding this concept to watch this video and this video is a clip from the movie Mulan um, one of my favorite Disney movies and in this clip I think it's a beautiful example of what a high context culture looks like in this clip Mulan um, is about to go see the matchmaker and the matchmaker is a woman who is going to set Mulan up with a husband but before she does that, the matchmaker has to evaluate Mulan, has to size her up and see well, who she would be compatible with. And I want you to, as you're watching this clip, to listen to the different words that the matchmaker uses to describe Mulan's value. One of the first things she says is that M Mulan has to stay silent. She has to stay dignified in order to impress her in-laws. The fact that she requests that Mulan be a silent, dignified, very peaceful looking woman in order to be impressive to the in-laws is a signal that that is a high context culture. They don't like a lot of talking. They like people to have really good posture, to have very good nonverbal behavior, and they value that more than they value language. Whereas on the opposite end of the spectrum, you see countries like the United States who very much value verbal communication, direct to verbal communication. Communication. And you'll find that when these two types of cultures meet, there can be a very serious clash because if one sees talking as uh, more powerful and one sees silence as more powerful, you can kind of see the tendencies for one culture to just be silent and rely on nonverbal communication, the other relies on mostly verbal communication and there can be a lot of miscommunication and difficulties when you're interacting with someone who is high or low context depending on where you're at. So again, if you need any further clarification, I highly encourage you to watch this clip. It's, I think, one of the best ways to explain the difference between high and low context culture. But again, I know that this is a really, really difficult concept. So if you have any questions about it, you know you can always contact me and I can definitely give you more examples or explain further. The second value actually is a lot easier to grasp onto, individualism and collectivism. Let me hydrate real quick. So, um, cultures that are individualistic or practice individualism, their primary responsibility is to themselves. You do you boo boo. Like you do whatever it is you want to do. Collectivistic cultures on the other end of the spectrum place primary responsibility with the harmony of the group. Whatever your dreams are, whatever you want to do individually does not matter as much as what the group needs. And the group can mean family, could mean your job, could mean your community, okay? Let me give you a couple examples. So first off, the United States is an individualistic country. We very much um, believe in that American dream of pulling yourself up by the bootstraps and working really hard to get what you want and just doing it yourself, right? And so that is definitely ingrained in our culture as Americans to be individualistic. 
collectivistic cultures um, tend to be the opposite, where they see primary responsibility as helping your family or your community or your work organization. Um, typically, this is Asian cultures, Latino cultures, and Middle Eastern cultures tend to practice this type of collectivistic thinking. Um, one example that a student once gave me was that she sees her culture as being very collectivistic because um, when she was growing up, she was a middle child, um, when she was growing up, her older siblings were expected to take care of her and she was expected to take care of her younger siblings that came after her regardless of whatever responsibilities she had. So even though she was in school and had work, she definitely had to set aside time to make sure she could take care of her siblings, tutor them, help them however she could. And she explained this as this was just a given. This was just an expectation in the family. So remember when I said you can't really see culture um, itself, you you see the different practices and the different signs of it that's a perfect example of how you can identify oh she must come from a collectivistic culture um, if there's so much primary if there's so much emphasis on responsibility of taking care of others or helping others you must come from a collectivistic country or cult culture a lot of students who see themselves more on the individualistic side come to me and say, well, Miss Wen, I feel kind of bad now because now I feel like just a really selfish person for being individualistic. And this is where I come in and say, go back to chapter one. Remember when we learned that there is no right or perfect or ideal way to communicate? It's the same with culture. There is no right or perfect or ideal way to practice culture. All of these values, like I said earlier, exist on a spectrum and they are either, they're not right or wrong, they're just appropriate in certain contexts or not appropriate in other contexts. Let me give you an example. So uh, my, uh, I was reading this article um, about uh, a Korean airline and this Korean airline had a lot, a lot, a lot of um, accidents all the time and it got to the point where they had to get investigated because they were consistently landing at the wrong airport or landing in the wrong place or overall just having various issues with the way that their airline was running and so the investigators decided to listen to the black box the the conversation between the co-pilot and the pilots to kind of see what was going on behind the scenes why are, why is this airline having so many issues and they found the conversations would go something like this the co-pilot the junior employee would say hey they would say something like hey i think we're about to hit that mountain over there um and the pilot would say nah we're fine don't worry about it trust me we're not going to hit that mountain and because they come from a more collectivistic society a more and we're going to talk about power distance in a second so keep this in your mind more high power distance society the um junior employee the co-pilot didn't want to question his superior didn't want to question the pilot so he would say okay i guess so and then spoiler alert they would still hit that mountain and they were right the whole time what this tells us is that in that context being more individualistic doing what you think is right and best and not what the group thinks is best made more sense in that situation However, collectivism is wonderful and beautiful in a lot of other contexts. You'll find that um, there is a, a wonderful organization in LA called LA Green Grounds. And one of the things that they do is that they plant gardens, like little vegetable and fruit gardens, where everybody in the community can partake and share. And you take as much as you need and you leave some from your neighbor. And that's kind of the mentality there. And it's incredible because you'll see people 50 people come in to help maintain the garden dig weed plant water the plants all of that kind of stuff so that everybody in the community can partake and share in the the bounty right the fruits and vegetables that come out of it and you can see there that practicing collectivism in that situation is wonderful because when everybody chimes in and does what is best for the group um they yield a lot of wonderful benefits for the group and for every individual as a whole and so when you look at these values make sure to not try to say like oh this is right and this is wrong just look at them as just existing they're just values and in different contexts they may mean different things to you and so that's the really important part about this is understanding how these values play out in your life and how they play out in other people's lives so that when you do 
um, encounter someone who may practice a different value set from you, you can understand in context what they practice, why they practice it, and what their values are. That will make you a better communicator and an effective communicator because you'll know who you're talking to. You'll know who you're interacting with. So that was individualism, collectivism. Our third one is power distance. So this is the degree to which members of a society will be okay with accepting an unequal amount of power. What that means is that those who are more low power distance tend to be okay with those in higher power positions to be close to them. Um, whereas in high power distance cultures, you'll see more rank and file. You'll see a longer literal metaphorical distance between those who are in charge and those who are not. A perfect example of a high power distance culture would be any type of military service. So if you think, if you have served, thank you for your service, but if you haven't, try to envision um, you know, what we know about um, military um, culture um, across the, the world, right? Not just in America. Um, there has to be rank and file, right? There are officers who are superior to other officers and those officers give orders and you don't ever disrespect a superior officer and that's just the given culture. That's an example of a high power distance where there's a lot of emotional, mental, and sometimes even physical distance between those who have power and those who don't, the leaders and the followers, right? If you look at this from a family perspective, um, those who have high power distance in a family perspective may have had more uh, more distance from their parents. They may have, uh, if you were a child that didn't question your parents a lot or were not allowed to question your parents a lot, you probably grew up in a high power distance culture. Those cultures tend to typically, and I say typically, generally speaking, tend to be Latino cultures, Latino, Latina cultures, Asian cultures, Middle Eastern cultures, tend to be very high power distance, whereas European cultures, Western cultures, America tend to be low power distance. One example of how I've experienced this is that in the United States, when I teach, um, sometimes students will feel comfortable calling me by my first name because other professors will call them by their first name. However, in Japan or other high distance cultures that I've taught, I've also taught in Mexico, they never call me by my first name. They, For example, in Mexico, they call me profesora or señorita. They, they call me by some sort of title. They never call me by my first name. And so again, you can't see culture, but you can see it in the way that we communicate with one another, the practices and the traditions that we have. And power distance is a great way to also see who has power and how those who have power are treated. Um, you can also see power in different business settings. So, for example, typical corporate boardroom meetings will have a long table and usually those who are in charge at that meeting will sit at the ends of the table, right? Um, so if you are a lower level employee, you don't get to just sit at the ends of the table, right? The head of the table, you have to sit on the sides with everybody else. So that is also a nonverbal way that we communicate power through, hey, you know, you give more space to those who have power. Does that make sense? Moving on to uncertainty avoidance, which I love because it's named for what it is. But uncertainty avoidance refers to the degree to how uncomfortable a certain culture is with things that are uncertain or ambiguous or that aren't defined and sure. In America, we are very low uncertainty avoidance. This is actually paired with the idea that we're also low context and low power distance. Because we're more low context as Americans, we're more likely to use verbal language to express ourselves. And so when we are in uncertain or ambiguous situations, we are more likely to just verbally ask, like, hey, what do I do here? What am I, what's going on? Or why is this like this? And we're more likely to confront and ask questions. Whereas cultures that are high context, high power distance, also tend to be high uncertainty avoidance. If I come from a culture that is high power distance, where there's a rank and file, I know my place in the world, right? That's my superior. These are the people that follow me. And all of that is already set for me. 
I'm growing up in an environment where uncertainty is not okay. So think back to my military example. Uncertainty or ambiguity or being unsure of something in a military setting is not conducive to that setting. It doesn't quite make sense. And so you'll see that as you look through these values, they actually pair up quite well with one another and relate with one another. And so those who are high uncertainty avoidance will try their best to avoid ambiguous uncomfortable situations because they don't quite want they don't have they don't they're just too uncomfortable with them because they've probably grown up in an environment where they're more high power distance and things are a little bit more set in stone so there's uncertainty avoidance Lastly, achieving achievement versus nurturing, also named for what it is. Uh, achievement cultures place high value on material gains, whereas nurturing cultures tend to uh, uh, see your wins, as you want to call them, through your journey, how many relationships you developed, um, how you grew. So let me give you an example. In America, we are definitely more on the achievement side. Um, for any of you who have been asked, well, what's your major in college? And how much money are you going to make with that major? Or what are you going to do? What kind of job are you going to get afterwards? Um, when are you going to get married? When are you going to buy a house? Those are all different ways that we communicate valuing achievement. Here in the United States, we do have this kind of set cookie cutter pattern which not all of us follow, I didn't follow it, um, but we do have this kind of cookie cutter pattern of you go to college, you get a job, and then after that job, you buy a nice house, and then you get married, and you have kids, and we have these kind of set markers of success, right, that are kind of threaded into the American dream. However, um, uh, that value on material success is not always conducive to um, recognizing the journey that comes along with that success. Nurturing cultures are the ones that focus on the journey. So a nurturing culture would ask you not what your major is and how much money you're going to make with it. Someone from a nurturing culture will ask you, what's your major and what do you like most about it? Or what do you kind of dream doing with it? Or who have you met practicing your major? And so they are more so interested in the journey, whereas achievement cultures are more so interested in those material wins and gains and the end goals that you get when you achieve something. So uh, depending on what type of culture you are, you come to value either um, end goals or the journey itself. I have a clip here from Finding Nemo, also to help you. So. so I also want you to think of, like I said, the varying degrees of these values. And now that we've talked about these five different values, I, I know that it's a lot, but I promise you, I promise if you watch this lecture, if you do our review videos, if you do the readings, um, it'll, it'll marinate and it'll sink in. Try your best on that journal. And again, always let me know in the journal or through email this is my best guess, Miss Wynn. This is what I think it means. Here's how I'm going to try to apply it. And again, you're going to get full credit if I can see that you're, you've given me a really detailed quality answer. So even if you're completely wrong, I will steer you in the right direction, I promise. So um, just let this marinate. Don't feel overwhelmed. I know we just went through a lot. All right, now we're going to go through more. So as you see through here on these slides, um, I want to clarify a couple of key terms that are presented to you in the textbook. And I think the textbook also does a great job of clarifying these as well. And I think these terms are really important for us to use. And from now on, if you use these terms in your journals, make sure that you're using them in, with these definitions and these understandings in mind. Because I know that we use words like race, ethnicity, and sex, and gender, and all of that. We use those words normally in our everyday conversations and in our wider social media conversations but I really want to make sure that we bring it down to the realist level like we understand it from a theoretical true definition of what this term means and so make sure that when you're using these words from now on in your journals that you're using them with these communication studies definitions in mind okay so First of all, ethnicity does not equal race. I know that we tend to use those quite interchangeably in our everyday lives, but they are not interchangeable. Why? First off, race is a category that we created as human beings to try to explain mostly physical differences between people um, that come from different regions of the world. And race has actually very little use in helping to explain individual differences. Ethnicity is more commonly used in intercultural communications and studies. 
and ethnicity refers to the degree to which a person identifies excuse me as part of being one group or not another group okay and that could be on the basis of nationality culture or some other grander culture or co-culture as we just talked about let me give you an example um, of this so if you were just to refer to me by my race only then i would be vietnamese right but calling me vietnamese for any of you who are immigrants, your parents are immigrants, or you know anyone who is an immigrant, you'll know that their immigrant uh, identity is not everything that they are. So yes, I was born in Vietnam and then I immigrated here, but I definitely do not behave, communicate, think, act, or otherwise exist in the same way a Vietnamese person living in Vietnam today exists, right? So for any of you who come from different countries, who come from China, who come from Mexico, I'm sure right now your time in the United States, or if your parents were immigrants, their time in the United States has made it so that they're not exactly like those people who are currently living in that that native that original land, their native land. Um, and so that is where the term ethnicity comes in to help us better understand and get that nuance that I was talking about earlier when it comes to people's identities. Because if you were to ask me my ethnicity and not my race, I would say I'm, like I said earlier, Vietnamese-American. I know a lot of my students call themselves Mexican-Americans. A lot of my students um, self-identify as Chicano or Chicana. A lot of my students prefer Latina or Latino. Um, and so because of that, that really um, helps them empower themselves to define what their ethnic identity is both in relationship to nationality, culture, and other perspectives that they may share all together. So is that clear? Um, another example I can give you is if you've heard of the term Hispanic, for example, the term Hispanic was actually created and coined um, as a racial category. Um, and it basically refers to individuals who come from Spanish-speaking countries, so Hispanic. But of course, ethnicity is more helpful for us in different situations because not every country in uh, South America, for example, is a Spanish-speaking country. Um, and just because you come from a Spanish-speaking country doesn't mean you speak Spanish either. So that's why um, students of mine now and other people that I know tend to refer themselves as Chicano, Chicana, Latino, Latina, because to say, for example, that you're Latino means that you hail from a Latin country. And that um, gives a little bit more nuance and detail and gives you more freedom to define your cultural identity in the way that you want. Um, whereas Hispanic is more racial category created. Um, and again, Remember that neither of these are bad or good, but I want you to understand that there's a difference between these terms and there's a difference between how we use them as well. So. All right, moving on. Next up, things I want to clear for you. Um, gender and sex, not the same thing. And I know that in a lot of those forms that you fill out, either for your job or for school, they might say gender, like male or female. They're not using it correctly. Um, Gender is not the same as your biological sex. So gender, like race, is a social construct. I'm going to get to that in a second. Sex is what you were biologically born as chromosomally. So um, pretty much the biological aspect of your humanness. If you are female or male, um, you will have different uh, uh, sexual organs, um, whether or not you're biologically male or female. Um, and of course, there is a, a, a percentage of individuals that are born androgynous as well. And we'll get, I'll let your biology teachers teach you that, but to let you know. Um, and so gender is a social construct because like race, we created different traditions and rules and ways of being for human beings that express their gender in different ways. So for all intents and purposes, I execute or perform, if you want to, I like to use the word perform because I think it helps explain it a little bit better. Um, uh, I perform, I, I practice the identity of being a woman, a gen uh, the, the typical woman, very well. I have long hair. Um, if you guys ever see me on campus, I'm usually in heels because I'm four foot ten and I'm super short and I like to make myself look a little taller and not get confused for a student every now and then. Um, I wear makeup and so I 
execute and match the social standards for that is what a woman looks like. Okay, um, men also have rules on what is considered masculine and what men should look like and how men should dress. So you can see there that it's a social construct because human beings decided that, nature did not decide that. So one of the key ways that you can see that in practice, even from birth, is that when babies are born in hospitals, female babies, biologically female babies, are put into pink blankets, whereas boys are put into blue blankets. There's nothing in our natural world, our natural reality that says women like pink and males like blue. There's nothing scientific um, in our external reality that dictates that. Um, human beings came up with that rule, right? Human beings were the ones that said like, oh, pink's a girly color and blue's a a boy color. Um, we're the ones that make those rules about gender constructs. And so that is why when we find individuals that do not conform to our ideas of what gender is um, or, or, or gender performance is, that's why um, uh, there are unfortunately um, people who are incredibly biased or anti anything that is not the typical gender presentation. So um, that is why, for example, um, members of the LGBT uh, community get um, harassed or get otherwise discouraged, judged, bullied um, because they don't match the gender rules, the social construct that we created as human beings. Um, and it's quite interesting that how invisible those lines are. Um, one example that I can give you is I have a friend of mine who is um, a transgender woman and she um, has not transitioned fully um but she she's almost almost there and when we hung out we were hanging out together at a bar together and just having drinks and having a good time and having a conversation she needed to go to the bathroom and I said okay well, let's just go to the bathroom I'll go to the bathroom with you and I had never realized for that moment how easy it's it is for me to go to the bathroom because when I go to the women's bathroom in public no one looks at me twice no one really has to wonder like what's she doing here because I again look physically like the typical presentation of what a woman looks like whereas um, my friend uh, does not and so she got a lot of stares a lot of whispers and I saw it with my own eyes and I could not believe the amount of privilege I had in that instance to just be able to pee in peace whereas she definitely could not go to the bathroom in peace and so these lines um, to us are so common and so kind of threaded into um, society to the point where we're quite invisible to the very strict ways that women and men are expected to dress act perform talk all of that kind of stuff so that's gender Age. Uh, age is another really key cultural factor that I think a lot of us don't really see as a cultural factor, but it is. Um, Age-related communication um, reflects just as much as biology does. We learn how to do certain ages. So if you've ever been told, act your age, right? Um, that is an indication that in society we expect certain things from certain ages. So when you're 10, you're expected to not behave like a toddler anymore. When you're a toddler, the expectation is, oh, you can throw a tantrum. It's okay. You're a toddler. If you're throwing a tantrum when you're 35, you know, you're not acting your age. And so we do have um, expectations on age. Some of those are biological. Obviously, you shouldn't be throwing tantrums when you're 35 because you should have matured your brain by then and been able to handle disappointment or whatever. Um, but we also, I think, have, just as we do with gender, different social constructs that dictate what we think of people of certain ages. So here in America, we definitely value youth, right? Um, if you just look at the market of all the different creams that we have, you know, possible to get wrinkles away and, you know, um, to brighten your skin and to make you look more vibrant and then we get teeth whitening and straightening and we do all these different things to try to make ourselves look, stay young and look young all the time because youth is valued as not only beautiful but it's also just valued as uh, being better in a lot of ways than being an older person. And so... 
you'll find that different cultures are the opposite where they value age more than they value youth. They see those who are older in society as people to be revered, as elders to be highly respected. And so in the same way that cultures can value different things, age is looked at in different ways and different perspectives by varying cultures as well. Socioeconomic status, um, I will have, I will say SES for short. So if you see that anywhere in the syllabus, your assignments, your journals, it refers to socioeconomic status. And what that means is um, your social class is a combination of how much money you make, so kind of where you are in that tax bracket, as well as where you um, can afford to live, and ultimately the resources provided to you in your social sphere. So in the US, um, most people identify as either three things working class middle class or upper class um, an interesting thing is that we find over and over again in different surveys Americans self-identify as middle class um, and the ones that identify as middle class range from thirty thousand dollars a year to eighty thousand dollars a year that's a huge gap right um, that's just a great example of how socioeconomic status just like culture just like gender um, also is privy to perception, right? Um, people who um, may not make as much as others still perceive themselves as being middle class. Very interesting. Um, and so working class, middle class, upper class tend to be those three kind of go-to identifiers that we have um, when we are expressing our socioeconomic status. Um, and a a reason for why I find this so fascinating and I think it is so important to know of to be a competent communicator is that a person's socioeconomic status greatly impacts, like I said earlier, the resources that are available to them. Um, we find, for example, in um, uh, lower income neighborhoods, schools definitely in those neighborhoods are not as equipped as schools that come from higher socioeconomic status and so we can uh, uh, the last study I saw found that um, a student from a lower class um, neighborhood um, versus a student from even just a middle class not an upper class but a middle class neighborhood who had a little bit more resources the middle class student actually knew a um, hundred plus more vocab words than the lower socioeconomic status student did within just the first year of kindergarten, which was absolutely crazy. So you can see that over time, um, within easily a two to three year span, um, students who are at lower resource areas, lower socioeconomic areas, tend to just have less resources for their education. That doesn't have an, an imp that has nothing to do with their personal ability as students. It says a lot about um, uh, their, uh, their educational resources provided to them really important factor to take in when we're communicating with other people from socioeconomic status. Um, this is a really cool statistic that I think is really important and I believe your textbook touches on it a little bit as well. But first generation college students, shout out to any of you who are first gen, go you, you're doing it. Um, first generation college students, um, definitely feel the strain of living in two worlds, especially um, if they come from a lower socioeconomic status where their parents couldn't afford to go to college and now their parents are trying to put them through college or they're going through college through scholarship. It's an incredibly different um, experience because you can't really connect with anyone in your family about shared college experiences. And you also feel that strain, you know, um, you don't want to be talking about school all the time around your family who did, you know, didn't have that opportunity. And so um, first generation college students definitely have um, lots of intercultural strain when it comes to trying to balance that, that school and home life. All right, so on the last tail end of this lecture and this chapter reading, which I know has been a lot, Bear with me. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. There's a reason why we're doing this. The reason why we're doing this is we are trying to learn varying skills and knowledge and understanding for how to be better intercultural communicators and ultimately better interpersonal communicators. And so one of the first things we have to remember to take away from all of the things we just learned is that all cultures have codes. And so in the same way a computer has code that tells it what to do, all human beings that share culture, share language or symbol system have code. Um, and so there's different codes for what is okay or not okay in a given 
nonverbal or verbal setting. Um, and we cover that in our five uh, value sets, but codes is our official communication studies way of discussing the different methods or ways that different cultures express themselves, either nonverbally or verbally. Language and identity is also very important. So this just deals with just verbal language, not nonverbal. Um, but what the language you grow up speaking and ultimately the language that becomes your native tongue and your second language have big impacts on your identity. This is a really fun um, uh, study um, and interesting piece of information um, that uh, a lot of communication studies researchers have replicated. If you speak if you live where everyone speaks the same tongue, language has little impact on your self-concept, little impact on who you think you are. But when some members speak a dominant language and others speak a minority language, you definitely see people feel more like the out group. This is definitely because we're so diverse here in California, something that happens all the time. So for any of you whose language are not, if your language is not if your first language is not English, you may feel like a big part of the out group. I definitely felt that way growing up. Um, I came here, my first native language that I ever spoke was Vietnamese. And then the next language I actually learned was in English, it was Spanish. Um, because my neighbor um, growing up, she babysat me and uh, her name was Belia and she spoke only Spanish. So I learned Spanish from her before I even went to kindergarten and learned English. So English is actually my third language. Um, and so because of that, that has had a huge impact on how I see myself um, as an American um, because I definitely grew up feeling like not part of the in-group. I didn't feel very American for a very long time because I definitely couldn't speak um, our dominant language here. And that had a huge impact on how I communicated with other people, my confidence as a whole, as an intercultural communicator. Um, of course, all that is much, much better now, but definitely growing up, I do remember feeling that sense of being an outgroup and you may experience that as well and I encourage you to reflect on that and I'm sure if your parents are immigrants they definitely experienced it and have shared it with you. Um, one thing that we also have to remember is that verbal communication styles differ all the time so in addition to those five values that we learned where behavior and communication can fluctuate depending on whether you're individualistic or collectivistic or low context or high context um, it can also vary along whether you're a direct culture or an indirect culture whether you just speak exactly what you want to say or if you're a little bit more indirect with it um, you can also be a culture that's very elaborate. You like to say a lot of words and you like to describe things with a lot of flowery language. You might be a culture that likes to be succinct, where it's just short and sweet to the point. You might be a very formal culture. Um, typically collectivist cultures and high power distance cultures tend to be very formal because in their uh, they have to build titles and seniority into their language in order to maintain that power distance and to maintain that sense of collectivism. Whereas in the United States, for example, we're much more individualistic. Um, we're very much focused on the individual person, so our language tends to be more informal where our pronouns, if you notice, are just you and I. If you speak another language, there's a multitude of different pronouns you can refer to other people as, and you have to refer to them by the right thing, otherwise you get in big trouble. So, how do we develop intercultural communication competence? Two things you need first. Um, remember that in chapter one we talked about competent communication is appropriate and effective, both of those things. In order to achieve that in an in intercultural setting, because remember culture just throws a wrench and all that makes it all more complicated. In order to achieve that in an intercultural setting, you need two things, motivation and attitude, on top of a lot of other things. But the first step is motivation and attitude. And it is incredibly hard. Um, because when you are trying to communicate with other people that are vastly different from you, either in their perspective, their culture, their religion, the language that they speak, all of that, it can be really frustrating to try to hold a conversation with someone, to develop a relationship with someone, because you see them as your out group. Like, I'm not you. Like, you're not, you know, in my in group. You're not someone that I'm used to having a conversation with. So that is why researchers say the number one predictor of intercultural success is motivation. Whether or not you are willing to continue to go on and on and on and keep trying even when you fail. And I will tell you all right now, when you 
practice intercultural communication in your life, you're going to fail. There are going to be times where you accidentally offend someone or you accidentally say the wrong thing or the other person doesn't quite understand you or you don't understand them. And that's okay. Um, That's why motivation needs to be there. And that's why the right attitude and mindset has to be there so that you can continue trying and keep going on. Um, Speaking from someone who uh, is... uh, an English language learner, I definitely had to make sure that I had the right motivation, the right attitude to not only learn how to speak English, but to speak it like an American, right? Um, I'm sure if any of you uh, hear me speak Spanish, you may definitely hear that I'm not a native, super native speaker in Spanish either, but I want to definitely try to make sure I speak as a native as much as possible in my pronunciation and the slang words I use and the, the, the terminology, the way I structure my sentences, you definitely tell. Um, but motivation and attitude are so important and I'm sure all of you have encountered an intercultural situation that didn't go the way you wanted it to right that maybe went bad or where you walked away from that situation probably more confused than you were happy with the situation and that's okay Um, it's never going to be perfect it's not going to be um, roses and daisies and yay kumbaya we all understand each other yay look at all these cultures that's quite not how it happens Um, intercultural communication is messy and it's very complex and that's why we go back to chapter one where we set the foundations for self-monitoring cognitive complexity and practicing all those skills over and over again until we are able to um, uh, and and on top of that we need motivation and attitude to keep us going keep us practicing those skills um, make us not give up so that we can actually become competent communicators and that's my big thing like you got to make sure that you have that motivation in there and my the textbook says the same exact thing Um, you may be a naturally talented communicator you may know a lot about other cultures but that does not mean that you are able to effectively communicate if you don't have the right motivation and attitude Um, you have to try not to be ethnocentric and um, ethnocentrism is the idea that your culture your way of being your way of living is superior and better than all other cultures and like I said when you grow up learning to be a certain way it's very easy to just be like well this is the way this makes the most sense Um, and you have to step back like I said in chapter one self-monitor and recognize okay like but this is my lens and this makes the most sense to me Um, how can I empathize with someone else where this may not make the most sense to them and so that's also quite important and lastly on top of motivation and attitude you need knowledge and skill what that means is that um, you need knowledge which you're in luck, you just got it because you just sat through a chapter two lecture where you learned about different cultural values, how different cultures interact with one another, what culture is, you learned what gender is, you learned about age, you learned about socioeconomic status, and you learned about how all these factors come in to impact communication on a regular, everyday basis. So you got the knowledge already, now you just gotta remember it, not just for the exam, but for communication. Um, And then the second thing you, you need is also skill. You need to be able, as we talked about in chapter one, to be that adaptable communicator where you know, I just tried to like say something and I don't think this other person's getting it. So I need to try a different way. And so you need not just the knowledge, but you need the skill. Knowledge is the theory of it. Skill is the practice of it. And you need to be able to do both. Okay. So To recap, we learned about culture. We defined culture and how it is bound by definition and perception. We learned about the different five cultural uh, values and how different cultures may be on different continuums and practice them at different ways. We learned about um, gender. We learned about the difference between race and ethnicity. And we also learned about age, socioeconomic status. And all of those are factors in understanding other people as well as ourselves. We learned that we need motivation and attitude in order to become strong intercultural communicators. And we also need knowledge of culture and we need skill to execute properly in communication settings. So now that we know all of that, I hope that this lecture has really helped distill a lot of the very thick, 
juicy parts of chapter two. I know it can be very overwhelming, but I promise you just give it some time. Have that motivation, have that positive mindset and attitude um, in order to just review it again and again. And always reach out to me if you find yourself in need of any help or clarification. Okay. So I just put some videos up in here um, to clarify some key concepts. They're not anything um, that you will be tested on, but they are definitely um, things, extra videos like that Mulan video, just extra videos to help you with understanding the concepts at hand. So I really recommend that you watch those videos. They're on my slides um, and they're just on YouTube. So you can just click on the, the little square boxes right here and watch them at any time to give you a little bit more real world examples of the theories that we're learning today. So I hope that this was helpful. I'm gonna go ahead now and call it out for your questions. I am ready.